Hey friends, sorry I've been mostly inconsistent these past few months, I've just been dealing with a lot of stuff and mostly just planning this incredibly long Jay Joyce ranking that I haven't been able to get back into the swing of things. Also the fact that nothing really interesting came out the entire summer also contributes to that, but let's not draw our attention to that. We're in a new release season with so much new music that it's kinda surprising. We're getting an Ashley McBride and a Tyler Childers album on the same day, we've already gotten a great John Party, and a good Cole Wetzel album of all things. But today, I wanted to draw attention to two albums which I have a bit to say about, and believe they're worth discussing, for one's greatness and one's mostly messy but still sincere nature. So let's start with the easy one. Drake Milligan's Dallas Fort Worth. Now, if you're a 50 year old who still uses cable and refuses to convert to streaming and enjoys mediocre dramas and reality shows, then you probably have a good idea who Drake Milligan is. He was the fan favorite on America's Got Talent and had a very Elvis like voice with incredible range. Most would compare him to Elvis, but he definitely has that Josh Turner charm to him as well. And it's probably due to his experience playing Elvis Presley on that Weird Son Records TV show. And side note, before we talk about the album, I just want to tell you how dumb this show was. It it clearly wanted to be a country music version of Empire with how intense the drama was exaggerated, the amount of sexual situations, and even down to the direction and cinematography. It was hilariously full of itself and got cancelled after one season because nobody really watched it. Drake did fine as Elvis, but the whole show was a train wreck. So I'm glad he moved on from it because this album right here? This is some good shit. I heard about this guy over the past few weeks during his run on America's Got Talent with his EP of last year hitting the top 5 on Apple Music. But I distanced myself because I was getting a Dylan Marlowe, Lane Hardy vibe off the guy. But then I finally decided to give his surprise album a listen. And boy was I blown away. You know how I had that feeling with Bronco where I just sat back and enjoyed the music? It was like that. Difference was, this is not quite as emotionally captivating as Bronco, but let's be honest, nothing really is ever going to be. But it certainly matches it in its incredible presentation. Because this record, not only is it country, it is proud of that fact and just goes off in every avenue from the vocal quality, the vast instrumental palette and its range of performance quality even down to the cadences. More than any true modern mainstream album, it exemplifies what it means to be country. Flower Shop sort of went there but ventured out into avenues that were either hit or miss. The Ronnie Dunn album had that instrumental quality but couldn't get anywhere beyond the drinking and neon aspect. Here it explores the worlds of not just 90s country but far beyond that, going for different shades and varieties in its melodic structure. I mean, for God's sakes, it does western swing. Like seriously, when was the last time a mainstream country album added a western swing song? It explores the worlds of orchestra-driven 80s country on Hearthstone Break Even, 70s ballads and Dance of a Lifetime, and the aforementioned western swing on Going Down Swingin'. I know people are flocking towards John Party as the musically best of the year, but I'ma just be honest. Drake kinda blows him out of the water. The only thing I'll give Party is the fiddle work on his album, but that's about it. Here, the music is just far more enticing and every musician truly plays off one another in an incredible dynamic, matching the emotional tones of each song perfectly. It's so exceptional in that aspect it's outstanding, with it possibly being the finest or at the very least the second finest this year for mainstream material. Instrumentally, it may steal the show and is easily the best part of the release, but that's not to undersell Drake himself. As I said, there's an Elvis and Josh charm to him, and his charisma greatly expresses so much of what he has to say. I feel like the real test of whether or not you're an amazing vocalist is based off one thing, and I credit Sideways for pointing this out, it's whether or not you can hear the artist's facial expression. And let me tell you. It is so hard to do that and you'd be surprised how many artists I'd say fit that list because it's so minimal. One of which is Alan Jackson and on his album last year you can hear him frowning, having a jovial time and feel every ounce of pain and joy on his face without even seeing it. Just hearing his voice and being able to perfectly visualize it. And the same goes with this album and the incredible vocalization down to the most mundane details. So much of this album displays his incredible vocal talent. It can get emotionally a little samey in the beginning, but once you get towards those deeper moments that dive into Drake the person is when the trait really starts to show itself. This album isn't particularly story driven, but it gives casual stories that are so expertly presented that are all about giving people a fun, wholesome time. Apart from Hearthstone Break Even, which explores the concept of breaking up in such a newfound perspective that's really interesting, and how the one who does the breaking gets off easy, even if it is mutual, as they get a fresh start and the other is stuck being alone. A refreshing take on the whole breakup narrative I enjoyed immensely. Apart from that, like I said, the rest is wholesome stories that can range from fun to a little wacky, all representing what most people value. It's all pretty neat. Except for one song. 
there's a song on here that isn't quite like the rest called Bad Day to Be a Beer. And when you press play on this song, you think, oh, it's gonna be a fun drinking song. You slowly lower your guard thinking, it'll just be like all the other alcohol-oriented songs you've heard throughout this album and throughout your time listening to country music. But then, you start paying attention to the lyrics and how he's taking these sentient beers hostage out on the water where there's nowhere to run. They're suffering in this heat because their flesh is made of metal. Of course it's going to absorb heat. Drake is trying to kill all these fish and he's failing. So what does he do? He begins draining the life out of these innocent cold beers. Sucking their life force from their heads. Forcing the other beers to watch while he does it. Telling them he loves them while he murders each beer's friends and family, all while the happy country band is still playing. It shifts from a jovial experience to something of sheer terror and malice. As Drake slowly but surely consumes all the innocent beers one by one, you begin wondering, is Drake Milligan a psychopath? Where did he hide the bodies? Am I next? Truth is, I don't know, but I do know that I'm scared. Nothing could have prepared me for this song. One of the most disturbing murder ballads I've ever heard in my life. A truly haunting experience I will never forget. Other than that, the album is super great. The only quote unquote weak link you could attribute to this album is maybe the writing which is still really good and has its standout moments quite a bit on the record. Nearly every aspect operates at such an efficiently high level throughout its entirety and never lets up on the quality. Every song here is either a banger, enticing, or emotionally captivating. And this came from freaking Stony Creek Records. I know not many of you are familiar with record labels and who's on them, but to put it into perspective, this is the same label that represents Jimmy Allen, Parma Lee and King Calloway, some of the absolute worst in the field. You'd expect them to drop something along the lines of that terrible new Mitchell Tenpenny album or expect Drake to be on a niche indie label. But it came from these guys. I don't understand how it happened and frankly, I don't care. It shows that labels aren't always binding artists down and can let creativity run wild and let the albums actually be, you know, actual country music. It's one of the most authentic country music experiences of the entire year and absolutely one of the musically finest. Rating wise, I'm feeling a strong 8 on Dallas Fort Worth. Now to move on to the more so confusing album. The brand new Kelsey Ballerini album, Subject to Change. I call this album confusing because my feelings on it couldn't be more split, as it simultaneously has some of Kelsey Ballerini's best and most authentic material yet, but at the same time, it still clings to what made Kelsey Ballerini's material mostly forgettable throughout the 2010s. I will say, the themes of this album progress quite naturally and highlight a more personal side to Kelsey far greater than any of her other albums. It almost has an indie charm in terms of that aspect, with how it portrays many parts of Kelsey's life from her friendships to her romance, and her perspective of her life going forward. In context to that, it builds upon the themes of Kelsey really well. Now that she's chosen her life, it's time to appreciate where she is. And it spreads these themes evenly across the album, coming to a very powerful close with the final track, What I Have. Not to mention, it's Kelsey's most country album to date? You thought the minute steal and fiddle on Hole in the Bottle in Half of My Hometown was Kelsey going country? Nope. It's this album. I expected a shift into more country-like tunes with just how much it's being openly embraced in the mainstream again, but I didn't expect it to be this fast. Kelsey said this would be more 90s inspired, and the pre-releases did not really show that, which is its own issue I'll get into later. But hot damn do some of these songs really go into that tone. If you're going down at so much fiddle, it's insane. And I know I'm not a guy that praises country music for being country, and I'm the same here because it's actually so gosh darn good. It definitely has that early 2000s The Chicks vibe with how much it's musically driven, and the Carly Pierce duet sounds like it came right off 29 Rand and Stone and its more emotional moments kind of make similar ones on Kelsey pale in comparison. A fair amount of this album is the ideal follow-up for Kelsey, progressing themes from her last album greatly, embracing a more country sonic identity, expanding her own musical capability in the arrangement and vocal department, and keeping up with the lyricism of the last album. All of this sounds like a suitable successor and more, right? Yeah, not quite. As much as I've praised this album, the thing is, 
That's only half of it. The other half of it is just a retread on why I didn't like any of Kelsey's music throughout the 2010s. I guess they call it founding is about as melodically and rhythmically annoying as bragger, weather is so obnoxiously overproduced and its mixing is so all over the place and lyrically it's so bad. It literally says you're killing my vibe. Yeah. That was a sing. I don't like heart or the little sing, sorry not sorry. You have all these strong country, not even that, just good, personal, and emotional moments and it's juxtaposed with so much forgettable pop mush. It reeks of just ripping off actually successful pop stars who themselves aren't particularly good. This isn't on the level of forgettable as that Ingrid Andress album, which is actually terrible, but when an album is full of so much potential and quality representing the ideal follow-up you desired, you can't help but feel a little ripped off. A part of this album feels like the album Kelsey Ballerini wanted to make given how great her self-titled acoustic tapes were, and the other feels like what Nashville executives wanted out of her. Lame, predictable melodies based off progressions designed to appeal to the most basic-minded consumer. And it's such a messy compromise of tones and musical quality that it makes enjoying this album as a whole pretty difficult. I will say the mediocrity is mostly concentrated in the middle part of the album and the beginning and end sound more like what Kelsey wanted this album to be. She even said that she was originally planning a deluxe album and instead just plopped all 15 tracks onto here. And I can't help but feel like this album would have been so much better had these more corporately design songs been cut. Actually, I can totally believe that. I'm really divided on this album because there's so much to love. Marilyn and What I Have are so exceptionally written and performed. Walk in the Park is such a neat slice of life track I can relate to immensely. The bops of this album are songs I'm gonna have on repeat all year. It represents the more girly side of country music so well with the country being mostly marketed towards men. But at the same time, it feels like such a regression that I can't truly decide whether or not it's good overall. Kind of similar to The Outsiders. The potential was there, but it just didn't go the distance in my eyes. Still check it out though, I do believe it's at least worth a listen to find the best tracks on here. Rating wise, I'm feeling a strong 6 on subject to change. Well, that's it for this week. I'm absolutely gonna check out the new Ashley and Tyler albums, and maybe this guy, who knows. Big Loud's albums haven't really missed in a while, so hopefully it'll be good. Until then, see you around.